Item Number SCP-101 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-101 is currently stored in the sub-basement 02 of Site-19, inside of a standard fireproof document lockbox, within a reinforced concrete room of standard facility size. Said room has been fitted externally with a standard double-door airlock, and internally fitted with appropriate safety response equipment as well as biological response equipment. Only personnel of Level 3 are permitted to enter the SCP-101 holding room. Personnel of Level 2 or lower are permitted to interact with SCP-101 only with directives from Level 3 or higher personnel, or with standing directives. The airlock for SCP-101 is set to a standard 10-minute cycle, during which standard screening scans for biological or environmental hazards will be made. SCP-101 is under standing directives for use during 0600 and 2000 hours. Outside of the airlock of the holding room for SCP-101, Two Level 2 guards are to be posted at all times, with overlapping shifts. Description: SCP-101 appears as a satchel or bag of intermittent size, with observations ranging from an opening of 15 cm in diameter to 70 cm in diameter. The depth of the container has varied, with no standard mean of equality to the relative diameter. The primary feature of SCP-101 is what appears to be a semi-humanoid mouth contained within the opening of the bag, with a mean standard of 31 centimeters of depth into the container, without more than two standard deviations of variance regardless of the apparent external depth of the container. The mouth consists of 32 teeth of an off-white hue, all of equal shape and size, consisting solely of incisors of approximately 10 centimeters in length. It has been observed, albeit not measured with accuracy, that within the mouth there is a tongue of indeterminate length with observations ranging from 50 centimeters to 3.5 meters. The mouth appears wet and spongy. However, all attempts at removal of possible fluids have resulted in failure, with damage to the instruments and harm to the personnel. The current decision is that SCP-101 may be part of a larger entity of extra-dimensional origin. SCP-101 is not externally mobile. However, Internal movements within the container can affect minor movements of the exterior of the container that consists of SCP-101's covering. It is understood that due to the nature of the size and probabilities of the container and object within, the object is of extra-dimensional interaction, if not origin. SCP-101 has exhibited polymorphic abilities, as well as a low level of sentience. The photo on file depicts the item as it was discovered in 1979 in a remote area of the Cascade Mountains, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Found along with SCP-101 was the decayed remains of a human, clad in a weathered black suit, seated upon an also weathered parachute, missing the right arm up to the joint of the shoulder, which appeared to have bite marks through the remaining bones, assumed to have been inflicted by SCP-101. Speculation as to the identity of this deceased individual has led researchers to the conclusion that this was one D.B. Cooper, remains removed for the purposes of concealing the existence of SCP-101. SCP-101 has since changed appearance and shape, with the apparent end of enticing a subject into reaching within the container. These appearances have ranged from money satchels, to deli boxes, to Krispy Kreme containers, to candy bags, all of which have an external appearance that is indistinguishable from that of the real containers. It has been proposed by Dr. that SCP-101 is semi-sentient in its attempts to lure subjects in. At the recommendation of Data Expunged, SCP-101 is currently in use as a means of refuse disposal for Site-19. SCP-101 has not shown adverse reactions to having foreign matter introduced to it, including but not limited to paper product, sewage, cafeteria refuse, metals, polymers, oils, and other products which are not consumable by any known biological entity. Addendum 1 So far, SCP-101 has not exhibited any abnormal behaviors from the standards observed, nor has SCP-101 emitted any substances, either foreign, extra-dimensional, or abnormal. However, it is the concern of Dr. that SCP-101 may produce an emission in the future. Addendum 2 Further examination under the direction of Dr. 
has determined that SCP-101 is ideal for the disposal of hazardous wastes and byproducts of other SCP-related projects. Said doctor is noted as being opposed to this measure. However, O5 has given authorization for the project to continue. Item Number SCP-106 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Revision 11-8 No physical interaction with SCP-106 is allowed at any time. All physical interaction must be approved by no less than a two-thirds vote from O5 Command. Any such interaction must be undertaken in AR-2 maximum security sites, after a general non-essential staff evacuation. All staff, research, security, class D, etc., are to remain at least 60 meters away from the containment cell at all times, except in the event of breach events. SCP-106 is to be contained in a sealed container comprised of lead-lined steel. The container will be sealed within 40 layers of identical material, each layer separated by no less than 36 centimeters of empty space. Support struts between layers are to be randomly spaced. Container is to remain suspended, no less than 60 centimeters from any surface, by ELO IID electromagnetic supports. Secondary containment area is to be comprised of 16 spherical cells, each filled with various fluids and a random assembly of surfaces and supports. Secondary containment is to be fitted with light systems, capable of flooding the entire assembly with no less than 80,000 lumens of light instantly, with no direct human involvement. Both containment areas are to remain under 24-hour surveillance. Any corrosion observed on any containment cell surfaces, staff members, or other site locations within 200 meters of SCP-106 are to be reported to site security immediately. Any objects or personnel lost to SCP-106 are to be deemed missing or KIA. No recovery attempts are to be made under any circumstances. Note, continued research and observation have shown that, when faced with highly complex or random assemblies of structures, SCP-106 can be confused, showing a marked delay on entry and exit from said structure. SCP-106 has also shown an aversion to direct, sudden light. This is not manifested in any form of physical damage, but a rapid exit to the pocket dimension generated on solid surfaces. These observations, along with those of lead aversion and liquid confusion, have reduced the general escape incidence by 43%. The primary cells have also been effective in recovery incidents requiring recall protocol. Observation is ongoing. Description SCP-106 appears to be an elderly humanoid with a general appearance of advanced decomposition. This appearance may vary, but the rotting quality is observed in all forms. SCP-106 is not exceptionally agile and will remain motionless for days at a time, waiting for prey. SCP-106 is also capable of scaling any vertical surface and can remain suspended upside down indefinitely. When attacking, SCP-106 will attempt to incapacitate prey by damaging major organs, muscle groups, or tendons then pull disabled prey into its pocket dimension. SCP-106 appears to prefer human prey items in the 10 to 25 years of age bracket. SCP-106 causes a corrosion effect in all solid matter it touches, engaging a physical breakdown in materials several seconds after contact. This is observed as rusting, rotting, and cracking of materials in the creation of a black, mucus-like substance similar to the material coding SCP-106. This effect is particularly detrimental to living tissues and is assumed to be a pre-digestion action. Corrosion continues for six hours after contact, after which the effect appears to burn out. SCP-106 is capable of passing through solid matter, leaving behind a large patch of its corrosive mucus. SCP-106 is able to vanish inside solid matter, entering what is assumed to be a form of pocket dimension. SCP-106 is then able to exit this dimension from any point connected to the initial entry point. Examples, entering the inner wall of a room and exiting the outer wall, entering a wall and exiting from the ceiling. It is unknown if this is the point of origin for SCP-106 or a simple lair created by SCP-106. 
Limited observation of this pocket dimension has shown it to be comprised mostly of halls and rooms, with data expunged entry. This activity can continue for days, with some subjected individuals being released for the express purpose of hunting, recapture, data expunged. Addendum SCP Review Notes Due to the exceedingly difficult to contain nature of SCP-106, SCP is to be reviewed every three months or during a post-breach incident. Physical restraints are impossible, and direct physical damage appears to have no effect on SCP-106. Current SCP revolves around basic observation and immediate response. Previous, more proactive special containment procedures have been recalled due to the events of breaches. Notes on Behavior SCP-106 appears to go through long periods of dormancy, in which it will remain completely motionless for up to three months. The cause for this is unknown. However, it has been shown that this appears to be used as a lulling tactic. SCP-106 will emerge from this state in a very agitated state, and will attack and abduct staff and cause gross damage to its containment cell on the site at large. Recall Protocol Data Expunged SCP-106 appears to hunt and attack based on desire, not hunger. SCP-106 will attack and collect multiple prey items during a hunting behavior event, keeping many alive in the pocket dimension for extended periods of time. SCP-106 has no determinable limit and appears to collect a random number of prey items during an event. The inner dimension accessed by SCP-106 appears to be only accessible by SCP-106. Recording and transmission devices have been shown to still operate inside this dimension, though recordings and transmissions are very degraded. It appears that SCP-106 will play with captured prey and appears to have full control of time, space, and perception inside this dimension. SCP-106 appears data expunged. Recall Protocol In the event of a breach event by SCP-106, a human within the 10 to 25 years of age bracket will be prepped for recall, with the compromised containment cell being replaced and restored for use. When the cell is ready, the lore subject will be injured, preferably via the breakage of a long bone, such as the femur, or the severing of a major tendon, such as the Achilles tendon. Lore subject will then be placed in the prepped cell and the sound emitted by said subject will be transmitted over the site public address system. SCP-106 will typically begin to gravitate toward the lore subject within 10 to 15 minutes after hearing the subject. Should SCP-106 not respond to the initial broadcast, additional physical trauma is to be administered to lure the subject at 25 minute intervals until SCP-106 responds. Multiple lore subjects may be used in the case of major breach events. SCP-106 will typically enter a dormant state after finishing with a lore subject. In addition, subjects may data expunged. Item Number SCP-112 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-112 is contained within an abandoned amusement park, designated site- Said site is to be staffed with a standard complement of 12 armed guards in designated Amusatastic Land garb to prevent civilian interference. SCP-112's power supply is housed within a standard Foundation prefab building with two high security door locks and a standard staff of six security staff and one operator. Since all other rides in site are intentionally disabled, civilian intervention is low. As the anomalous properties of SCP-112 occur regardless of its condition, only mandatory maintenance work is to be done on SCP-112. This also ensures that local civilians treat SCP-112 and its surroundings as abandoned and ignored. All tests involving SCP-112 must be conducted with a portable toilet nearby, as well as a small table with basic food and drink items. Description. SCP-112 is a steel sit-down roller coaster, formerly known as the Blue Steel Surfer. Built in 19... SCP-112 was marketed as the crown jewel of the amusement park. Initial testing of the ride resulted in extremely negative experiences from testing staff. When these reports became public knowledge, the financial repercussions of the failure of the Steel Surfer resulted in the parent company of the amusement park going bankrupt. The property was abandoned 
and undisturbed until a local gang broke into the park and reactivated the improperly disabled rides, SCP-112 included. When police attempted to arrest the members who were exiting SCP-112 after its inaugural ride, the riders began to attracting local media attention. Suspecting the ride had traits within its mandate, the Foundation purchased the park under the auspices of rebuilding the park as a musatastic land in order to test any potential anomalous properties from the ride. When SCP-112 is started, the ride functions as expected until Point Alpha, its primary drop. When a car reaches Point Alpha, the train vanishes. After three minutes, the estimated time the train would normally take, the train rematerializes at Point Omega, three meters from the coaster's starting point. Human subjects riding SCP-112 have a drastically different experience compared to outside observation. The time frame between Point Alpha and Point Omega is massively extended, with subjective ride times ranging from four minutes to several months. The properties of the ride also vary from person to person. Most subjects report elements on the ride that do not exist on the ride proper, like bat wings, cobra rolls, and inclined loops. Subjects do not have any sense that the rest of the world is alien or otherwise different. Only the ride experience is different. Upon exiting the ride, subjects typically experience feelings of confusion and ill health, depending on the subjective time they spent riding SCP-112. These feelings are based not on any physical maladies, but the subjective experience of dealing with a physical malady for an extended period of time. For example, a subject with a subjective ride time of three days may experience confusion that he had strong feelings of hunger for most of his ride, but at the end of the ride, he was not hungry at all. Addendum A Assorted Experiments Experiment 11234534 Subject D34534 D34534 was sent on SCP-112 at 2.42 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 2.43 p.m. Rematerialization at 2.46 p.m. Upon exiting SCP-112, D-34534 quietly asked for aspirin before passing out. Upon revival and medication, D-34534 reported a subjective ride time of 36 minutes, with multiple loops and twists not found on SCP-112's architecture. Experiment 11267564 Subject D-67564 D-67564 was sent on SCP-112 at 1.30 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 1.31 p.m. Rematerialization at 1.34 p.m. D-67564 reported a subjective ride time of 4 minutes, which D-67564 reported as enjoyable, with the exception of that part where the car jumps off the track and lands right before the loop. Experiment 1125893 Subject D-5893 D-5893 was sent on SCP-112 at 12.30 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 12.31 p.m. Rematerialization at 12.34 p.m. At the end of the ride, D-5893 immediately ran to the table with consumables, wordlessly consuming everything he could grab onto, including the wrappers of previously consumed food objects. D-5893 became violent when Foundation staff attempted to subdue him even going so far as to expunge. Upon capture and interviewing, D-5893 remained confused and disoriented, continuously saying the phrases, no food till the ride is over, let me sleep, let the spinning stop, and 152 lights. The Foundation believes that D-5893's statements imply that his subjective ride time was approximately five months long and during his trip he experienced five months worth of malnutrition and exhaustion, despite no physical proof of these experiences found. Experiment 1127556 Subject D-7556, one standard issue camera facing D-7556. D-7556 was sent on SCP-112 at 11.36 a.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 11.37 a.m. Rematerialization at 11.40 a.m. D-7556 experienced symptoms similar, but muted, to those of D-5893. During the interview, D-7556 explained that his subjective ride time was one month and six days long. During his trip, he was unable to eat or sleep, 
and suffered major headaches from SCP-112. D-7556 reported experiencing every sort of roller coaster element currently in use, and a few believed to be conceptual. Camera footage lasting three minutes shows D-7556 sobbing for the duration of the ride, with movement consistent with SCP-112's physical track. Addendum B. Rider Interviews Experiment 112-35784-23512 Post-Ride Interview 1 Subject D-35784 Interviewer Dr. Interview Type Post-Ride Interview Doctor How are you feeling, 35784? D-35784 Rolls eyes I'm fine It was just a roller coaster ride, dude Maybe you have me confused with the other guy you know, the one that attacked when the ride was over. Doctor, I will. In time. Describe your experience on SCP-112, please. D-35784. Laughs. What's there to say? Before I was sent to jail, I designed coasters. A couple minutes too long of a ride, you always gotta worry about that. But the twists that thing has are damn good. A few of them I'm pretty sure I mocked up back in the day. It would have been a lot better if the next to me wasn't acting like a damn fool. Doctor. D-23512. What was he doing? D-35784. Sighs. It's what he wasn't doing that pissed me off. He was slouched over so much that his restraints were taut, just facing forward. Think his mouth was open the entire time. If it were possible, I'd say he looked like someone who had been on a crying jag for a few hours. I don't know. When we got that slow point before the banked curve, I tried snapping my fingers in front of him. Idiot just barely turned to face me. And you know what happened afterwards. Doctor. Yes, he punched you. D-35784. Not really a punch, really. Slapped me, shaking me, trying to choke me. I didn't get the impression that he really wanted to kill me, just wanted to get an answer out of me. That's what he said, actually. Shit, like, why didn't you look at me, and... Why did you not stop cheering the whole time, in a very hoarse voice? Was in mid-question with another when the guards introduced their rifles to the back of his head. Experiment 112-35784-23512 Post-Ride Interview 2 Subject D-23512 Interviewer Dr. Interview Type Post-Ride Interview Forward this interview was conducted three weeks after riding on SCP-112 with D-35784. D-23512 is not willing to speak verbally since his ride. From time to time he attempts to speak, but shows signs of discomfort and pain in doing so, stating that his throat is too sore to talk. While there are no medical issues with D-23512, his experiences have obviously left him traumatized from his experience on SCP-112. Dr. Wood estimates a full recovery is possible before monthly terminations, and at such time, he will be capable of estimating precisely how long his subjective ride time was. This interview was conducted through written communication. Given his fixation on certain traits of the ride, this transcript has been edited for brevity. Doctor. Hello, 23512. How are you feeling? D-23512. Still hurts. Still dizzy. Loops and loops. Spins, spins, spins. Forever and ever. Doctor, why do you say your throat hurts? D-23512. Screamed. Screamed over and over. Girl wouldn't answer me. She never looked at me. I screamed and screamed till I couldn't scream anymore. Throat got better. Screamed again. Never looked, never noticed. Just kept cheering the hell of ups and downs and downs and ups and side to side and side to side. Doctor, I'm assuming you're talking about the person who went on the ride with you. 35784. D-23512. Girl with the big jiggling tits. Cheered and laughed and cheered and laughed. Every spin, every turn, every twist. Even when it got dark, I could hear her laughing and wooing. Couldn't sleep because of her laughing and cheering. Light and day, bright and dark, always screaming and giggling. How could she do that? Doctor. She told me you were just sitting there, staring ahead. She said she tried to get your attention, but you never responded. D-23512. I waved and shook her. She didn't move, didn't notice. Just kept cheering. Tried to tune her out for a few months at a time, but she never. 
never, never noticed me. Kept cheering, kept screaming, kept laughing at me as I starved and peed myself and slammed my head against the side till I bled. Just kept laughing and screaming through the loops and the spins and the deep, dark dips that never ended, never stopped crushing. Doctor, 23512. I'm trying to help you, but acting insane won't help you in the least. There was no injury to your head at the end of the ride. D23512. I there, I felt it. The warm on my head till it got cold and stopped spilling. Still itches. Doctor, so what happened at the end of the ride? You had a bit of an issue with 35784. D23512. She stopped laughing and giggling after all that time, and she looks at me and smiles and says, Nice ride, eh? And I shook her and tried to ask her why she wouldn't stop laughing and screaming. I didn't want to hurt hurt her. Not really. Just wanted to know why. Why? 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 Repeats several times till 23512 is disabled. Item number SCP-201 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures No personnel are to come within 40 meters of SCP-201 at any time. Any and all work done with SCP-201 is to be performed via remotely controlled drone. Any personnel entering the containment area must be accompanied by two members of security. All personnel in containment area must wear a restraint harness with safety rope attached to the wall. Rope will allow access to within three meters of the minimum safe area. Exceeding this distance will result in physical removal from containment area and formal discipline. Those affected by SCP-201 are to have time and date of exposure, disappearance, and return, along with any and all personal information, recorded in log Subjects who appear are to be recovered as soon as possible by agents, and debriefed immediately. Description SCP-201 appears to be a very old piece of medical equipment, superficially resembling an IV stand, but with many other glass and metal items attached to it. SCP-201 stands 1.8 meters, or 6 feet tall, and has a mass of 36.5 kilograms, or 80 pounds. The metal portions are made of steel and brass, and various parts are connected with rubber tubing. The two IV bags are porcelain and are open at the top. SCP-201 was recovered in the hospital in a long unused storage area. No record of SCP-201 appears anywhere in hospital records. Entering within 30 meters of SCP-201 can result in the subject being displaced into an alternate reality. This effect is apparently random, with some subjects remaining totally unaffected after exposure to SCP-201. Those affected will cease to exist in our reality between 1 and 48 hours after initial exposure. Durations of displacement vary between a few hours and upwards of eight years. Time spent in this alternate reality can vary greatly from actual time elapsed in our reality. This alternate world appears identical to our own, with these exceptions. It is apparently in a state of constant twilight, with no sun or moon visible at any time. Large banks of very dense gray fog travel very low to the ground. These fog banks are unaffected by wind and can make exposed skin feel very sticky and dirty. There is no plant or animal life anywhere. All places of human habitation, including major cities, appear as if all life suddenly vanished in the same instant. Most, if not all, electrical systems appear to be broken or without power. The air will randomly take on a gray-brown tint accompanied by strong wind. Subjects displaced to this alternate world report initial surprise and curiosity, which are shortly replaced with very strong feelings of loneliness and fear. The severity varies widely with individual subjects and with the time of displacement. Upon the end of displacement, subject will reintegrate from this alternate world to our own, which can cause a great deal of shock, especially in urban settings. Most subjects who remain displaced for more than three months suffer lasting psychological damage, consistent with being sequestered within solitary confinement. In addition, reports of intermittent, fragmentary broadcasts 
have been returned by subjects appearing to repair power to media devices, such as televisions and radios. It is unclear if these are real or the product of the degraded mental states of those remaining long enough to complete said projects, but reports consistently resemble automated messages prepared by the Foundation in contingency for XK-class scenarios. Testing will commence if viable samples can be recovered. Item Number SCP-216 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-216 currently resides in Laboratory 5. Access requires Level 2 clearance. Insertion of recording devices into SCP-216 is prohibited without O5 approval. Description SCP-216 is a 35.6 cm or 14 inch high iron safe with a multiple dial combination lock. The lock has seven dials each, with numbers ranging from 0 to 9. The combination cannot be changed while the door is open. The weight of the device appears to fluctuate in an obtuse manner. The door of SCP-216 can always be opened, but the accessible interior space appears to change depending on the currently entered combination. Objects placed inside SCP-216 may be accessed by re-entering the combination that was configured when the object was inserted. Objects retrieved from SCP-216 appear to be undamaged by the device. It is speculated that every possible lock combination results in a different interior and that there are approximately 4 million available compartments. It is unknown how many objects currently reside inside SCP-216. An engraving found on the bottom of the safe reads three quarters. It has been hypothesized that the compartments of SCP-216 are shared with three other devices of a similar nature. This hypothesis is consistent with the findings reported in Document 88-B. Document Number 88-A Initial Test Log Combination lock set to 6692724 and door opened. Compartment appears empty. One notebook and pencil placed inside and door closed. Combination lock set to 6692725 and door opened. Compartment appears empty. Combination lock reset to 6692724 and door opened. Notebook and pencil retrieved from compartment. Note. SCP-216 appears to be a very efficient storage solution. Dr. Document number 88B, Test Log 1. Testing the effect of inserted items on the SCP's total mass. Total mass of unit before inserting item, 935.877 kilograms. Notebook and pencil, total mass, 350 grams. Inserted into SCP-216 and door closed. Total mass of unit after inserting item, 935.965 kilograms. Expected mass, 936.227 kilograms. Actual mass, 935.965 kilograms. Difference, 262 grams. Testing shows that SCP-216 takes on approximately 25% of the mass of its contents, suggesting the mass is distributed evenly between SCP-216 and the three other hypothesized devices. Document number 122-A, Test Log 2. Compartments 0000000 to 0000206 checked for contents. Compartment 0000000 found to contain traces of sawdust. Compartment 0000001 through 0000206 found to be empty. Further testing arranged. Document number 152-D, Test Log 3. Compartments 00332 through 00398. Each compartment had a body part from a 28-year-old female who had been reported missing on data expunged. Contents removed for identification and then incinerated. Liver, spleen, and lungs not recovered. Document number 159-B, Test Log 4. Compartment 00409, a live wolverine, Gulo Gulo, 
adult male, with a mass of 30 kilograms. Upon the door being opened, it attacked and killed Dr. and mutilated two nearby D-Class personnel before being shot five times by guards. Autopsy of the Wolverine revealed no anomalies. Subsequent examination of compartment 0000409 has revealed it now contains only loose Wolverine hair, with residual traces of Wolverine urine and Wolverine anal musk. Document number 160-A, Test Log 5. Compartment 0000456, a fully loaded Glock 19 handgun with a round in the chamber and one regular flavor Klondike Bar ice cream dessert. The ice cream bar was not melted, cold to the touch, and remained so as long as it was in the compartment. It was removed for inspection and began to melt within two minutes. It was placed back in the compartment. The door closed for three hours and then reopened. The ice cream bar was in the same slightly melted state as when it was placed back three hours prior. The ice cream bar was removed, placed in a freezer in the nearby second floor cafeteria for one hour. After one hour, it was placed back into the compartment with the handgun, and the door closed. Document number 161-A, Test Log 6. Chamber 000501, confirmed to be empty, had one standard foundation GPS unit placed inside it. When the chamber was sealed, GPS failed. Data from the unit upon retrieval showed that the satellite was unable to confirm source location during this time. Document number 174-B, Test Log 7. Chamber 6162384, 51 apple seeds. Chamber 1846563, 22 apple seeds. Chamber 2960104, 9 apple seeds. Chamber 8585821, 78 apple seeds. Chamber 1111111, 1 heavily decomposed apple. Document number 152-E, Test Log 8. On 0416, all previously checked compartments were opened with the intention of confirming contents. When compartments 0000332 and 000398 were opened, individual body parts were found corresponding to an unknown male, arranged in the same order as found in Experiment 152-D, including the liver, spleen, and lungs. All previous traces of tissue from Experiment 152-D, which had not been cleaned, were found to have been sterilized from these compartments. Pursuant to request for O5 Directive, body parts were placed back into their compartments. Containment procedures currently under review. Document number 162-A, Test Log 9, Testing Performed by Dr. One digital video camera recorder was set to record and placed in compartment 5500000, oriented so as to face outward towards the door. The door was closed, and compartment 5500001 was opened. Compartment 5500001 was found to be empty. The door was closed, compartment 5500000 was opened again, and the video camera recorder was retrieved. Upon viewing the recorded footage, Dr. Brown suffered from a transient ischemic attack. The recorded footage shows said doctor placing the video camera inside the safe and closing the door. No time passes before the door is reopened and the video camera is retrieved from the safe. This is inconsistent with the scene reported by Dr. Brown. No audible sound is present on the recorded footage. A subsequent analysis of the video camera revealed that several internal components of the camera had been fractured. Document number 162-B, Test Log 10, Data Expunged, Data Expunged. Document number 162-D, Test Log 11. One tape recorder was placed inside compartment 5500000 and the door was closed. Several other compartments were opened and closed before returning to compartment 5500000 and retrieving the tape recorder. The following file has been reported to cause disorientation, nausea, sweating, and a sense of overwhelming despair, abdominal pains, panic attacks, migraines, and strokes. This file should only be listened to in a secure environment. Do not drive or operate heavy machinery for up to 24 hours after listening to this file. 
Refrain from making quick eye movements while listening to this file. Item number, SCP-234, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-234 is studied at Containment Area 06-234, which encompasses the 300-meter radius red zone of SCP-234. The main laboratory building within the red zone is built as an open-air structure, with no doors or closed windows. No closed containers or spaces of any kind are allowed within the red zone of SCP-234. Any space which inadvertently becomes closed within the red zone is to be declared a Class II Dimensional Implosion Hazard and must be remotely destroyed on site following mandatory evacuation of the laboratory area. Personnel trapped within a closed space are to be considered lost. Experimentation with SCP-234 may only be performed with express prior permission from at least two Level 4 personnel. Experimentation which introduces closed spaces into the red zone of SCP-234 may not exceed one liter in volume, and must be treated as a Class 3 dimensional implosion hazard. Description SCP-234 is a species of organism of presumed extra-dimensional origin resembling fish, measuring approximately 25 millimeters in length. SCP-234 does not appear to have any eyes or light-sensitive organs, but navigates via a highly evolved sense of echolocation. It maintains buoyancy via a gas-filled organ similar to a swim bladder, which allows it to float in the air, and exhibits behavior consistent with an omnivorous scavenger organism, though to date it has not been observed consuming any terrestrial organic matter. SCP-234 appears to only be able to exist within a closed, air-filled space, and will spontaneously come into existence whenever such a closed space exists, or is brought within the red zone, an area of approximately 300 meter radius, in a remote area in the mountains near… When an SCP-234 specimen is startled, killed, brought out of the red zone, or the closed space containing the specimen is breached, all matter including air, within the closed space is immediately extra-dimensionally evacuated with sufficient force to cause a catastrophic implosion within the surrounding area. SCP-234 was discovered following a series of incident reports and disappearances of backcountry hikers near A Foundation survey team sent to the area inadvertently created a closed space with a standard adverse weather camping tent, whose subsequent implosion resulted in the disappearance of one research personnel and severe injuries to an additional two agents. Research is ongoing into how SCP-234 is capable of extra-dimensional movement. Experimentation is hampered by the inability to study SCP-234 outside of closed spaces, and attempts to trace evacuated objects via the use of tracking devices have yielded no results. To date, objects evacuated by specimens of SCP-234 have never been found again. Addendum 2341 Incident Log 234-031 On Dr. accidentally introduced a closed space into the red zone of SCP-234 in the form of a sealed coffee thermos. Upon opening the container, the resulting implosion startled four additional SCP-234 instances within the testing area causing a chain reaction that inflicted severe damage to the laboratory, as well as causing injuries to six research personnel. 
Post-incident photographs of the remains of Dr. are kept on file as a warning to research personnel assigned to SCP-234 as to the consequences of carelessness during experimentation. Item Number SCP-238 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-238 is currently contained by the original means. Current SCP protocols have proven unable to fully contain SCP-238. All exploration of SCP-238 is suspended until full sustained containment has been achieved. Any and all personnel attempting to enter SCP-238 are to be physically restrained and moved to an outside containment area. Upkeep of the current barrier is top priority, and a minimum of two personnel are to be present at all times for upkeep and security. No testing, samples, or exploration may be conducted within SCP-238 until full containment of SCP-238 has been achieved or with approval by Site Overwatch. Any and all persons entering are to be deemed missing, presumed dead. Description SCP-238 is an enormous underground facility with a single entrance on the island Schmitta to the extreme north of Russia. Tunnel networks have been shown to extend for thousands of kilometers with major junctions under data expunged. When originally found, the entrance was sealed behind a massive wall of bricks covered in carvings. This wall was removed and exploration began. Initial tests showed that the walls of SCP-238 were primarily fossilized tissue of unknown origin. Several structures within the facility led initial exploration teams to conclude that SCP-238 is, or was, at least half biological. Shortly after discovery of a central chamber, reported to consist of partially rotted flesh and badly decayed metal structures, personnel began to disappear and numerous accidents claimed eight lives. Noises and other hallucinations were reported. Eight containment walls and associated personnel were destroyed by unknown means, with a survivor reporting unconfirmed, in addition to rapidly escalating aggressive phenomenon by SCP-238. Replacement of the original wall has contained the item effectively, but new SCP containment and research strategies have been requested, as the current containment prevents in-depth exploration and experimentation. Addendum 238-S7 Upon the escape of six juvenile instances of SCP-1013, the local SCP team assigned to SCP-238 reported SCP-1013 squeezing through the original wall and entering the underground chambers. After several members of the O5 Council and Doctors and Doctor were notified, they elected to send in a single team to retrieve SCP-1013. Further information regarding the expedition is found in Document 238-S7A, with Clearance Level 3 required. The end result of the retrieval team were six dead, two critically injured, one missing in action, and the six juvenile SCP-1013 instances being recaptured. Further research into SCP-238 will be carried out under SCP supervision. Document 238-S7A Audio log of retrieval of SCP-1013. Begin. Skip. 3 hours 41 minutes 16 seconds. Personnel D-299. I don't see nothing. Not that damn thing we're looking for, not that f***ing suit that was supposed to watch us. Not even a exit. Agent. You will hold your comments. Agent is currently covering the central chamber, so nothing can escape. Personnel D-299. Like us? I don't see... Agent. Shut it! Personnel D-299. Why I have to... Agent. I said quiet! Now! Personnel D-299. Carry on like a f***ing boy scout. Agent. Shut the hell up, you idiot! There's movement up ahead. Sounds of scraping and grinding are heard. Several minutes pass. Personnel D-299. That don't look like number but that ain't natural. Agent. Incomprehensible. It's not. Delta 299er, open fire, now! Sounds of gunfire are heard. Agent. Life signs terminated. Personnel D-299. 
Life signs terminated. End. Item number, SCP-240. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-240 is to be kept in the secure artifact storage facility in Site-77. Due to its age and delicate construction, SCP-240 is to be contained in a vacuum-sealed container with humidity and temperature levels constantly monitored and controlled. The mouthpiece is to be permanently covered. No subjects are permitted to enter SCP-240's containment chamber. Description SCP-240 is a vehicle capable of air travel. It is constructed from a wooden rod which the operator sits in the middle of, a mouthpiece connected to a pipe device, and a large canvas sack which contains a porthole for exhaust fumes to exit. The words Morsum Kite have been painted on the spot the operator is intended to sit on. The words From Many Comes Might are sewn into the canvas. When activated, SCP-240 is capable of flying for approximately twice the duration of the user exhaling into its mouthpiece. Following this, it will enter a slow descent and ultimately land. Although it can only take off from land, testing has shown that SCP-240 is capable of landing on water and heavier-than-air gases. For every one newton of force the user exerts into SCP-240, there will be 50 newtons of thrust in return. It produces dust emissions within the barrels. These emissions contain minerals such as nickel, copper, gold, platinum, potassic feldspar, and pyrox ferroite. However, the steel drums do not appear to have any connection to the mouthpiece or piping. Additionally, users utilizing SCP-240 have occasionally reported tasting ammonia, sulfur, and having hot gas rush through causing severe lung discomfort. Post-test medical examinations have not shown any corroborating damage to the subject's bodies. SCP-240 was discovered in 1927 in the possession of the Morsum Space Society, an organization dedicated to astrological research, following a raid on their headquarters due to bootlegging charges. Notes recovered during the operation indicated the bootlegging had been done to finance SCP-240. It was found inside the home and taken as evidence by the UIU. Its extra-normal capabilities were not discovered until three years later, when an evidence clerk casually blew into SCP-240 and was thrown across the room, suffering a broken nose and three fractured ribs. SCP-240 was immediately transferred to the Foundation while a non-functional replica was handed over to the UIU. Due to the age and relative obscurity of SCP-240, it was not difficult to manufacture documentation, discrediting it as a hoax. Addendum. Utilizing fiber optic camera technology, Foundation researchers were able to place cameras within SCP-240's mouthpiece during flight. Over the course of the examination, the camera recorded a location in space which appeared very similar to the solar system. However, the Earth and Moon were missing, and Venus had several possibly artificial satellites around it. All orbits were moving notably faster at a scale similar to the scale of the input-output of SCP-240. Further testing is currently being conducted. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.